How have perceptions, policies, and benefits changed for the LGBTQ veterans in the post Don't Ask, Don't Tell world? This panel explores the historical context as well as the continuing challenges facing LGBTQ service members and veterans. Welcome, everybody. We're fortunate to be able to kick off this set of conversations about such a critical issue to United States society, politics, and the world. Um, I think that the experiences of individuals in the military tends to stay with them for a long time and provide an important touchstone, not only while they're in the service or serving in a war, um, but also afterwards as well. And understanding the full range of those experiences is a big part of what conversations like the ones this is kicking off here can do. Uh, the experiences you'll hear tonight from the panelists run from, come from those who have studied these issues in, in the military, who have uh, influenced the uh, progress of LGBT rights and human rights in the military, and who have lived that experience in, in, in the service and then after, after serving. So what I'll do is give you a brief bio of each of our panelists here, and then I'll ask each of them to speak for a few minutes about their experiences and knowledge on these particular issues. Um, then we'll have a conversation uh, among ourselves. I'll ask some questions, and then we'd love to hear from you too and take some questions from you. So can I start by asking how many of you uh, served in the military? Okay, that's always an important backdrop to understanding who, to whom we're, we're talking about this. These are issues that affect all of us um, and have a different resonance sometimes for those who've actually served. So let me start by introducing Aaron Belkin to my left here. Aaron is a scholar, author, activist, and dancer. He's written and edited more than 25 scholarly articles, chapters, and books. Um, the most recent of which is a study of contradictions in American warrior masculinity and the ways in which smoothing over those contradictions makes U.S. empire seem unproblematic. He also wrote an exceptional study of this political strategies that brought Don't Ask, Don't Tell to an end. That book is called How We Won, appropriately so, because we did win. He'll tell you some about that, perhaps, as will our next uh, panelist there. Um, Aaron is a, a, a professor of political science at San Francisco State University. He's the founding director of the Palm Center, which the advocate named as one of the most effective gay rights organizations in the nation. He earned his BA in international relations at Brown and his PhD in political science across the Bay at UC Berkeley. Next is Commander Zoe Dunning. Um, Commander Dunning, now retired, graduated from the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis in one of the earliest classes that included women. In January of 1993, while still a student at Stanford, she publicly came out as a lesbian in protest of the ban on, on gay service in the U.S. military. One of the first military members to be prosecuted under the Don't Ask, Don't Tell regime, Zoe successfully won her discharge hearing and continued to serve as the only openly gay member of the U.S. military for the next 13 years, retiring after 22 years of service. She now serves on the executive committee of the Veterans Caucus and the LGBT Caucus of the California Democratic Party, and she's a senior fellow with the Truman National Security Project. Finally, uh, Jeff Mueller. Jeff is an active duty Air Force officer stationed at Los Angeles Air Force Base. He earned a Bachelor's of Science in Aerospace Engineering from the University of Notre Dame and a Global Master's of Business Administration from the Thunderbird School of Global Management in 2011. During his Air Force career, he served in nuclear missile or operations, space test and evaluation, ballistic missile defense testing, and systems engineering. He's an active member of the Civil Air Patrol, the official auxiliary of the U.S. Air Force, mentoring youth through, who have an interest in aviation. He's been a member of OutServe, Service Members Legal Defense Network, or SLDN, since 2011, serving as the founding chapter leader for Colorado and Wyoming. He was elected to the board of OutServe SLDN and was elected co-chairman of the board as well, a role he currently serves in. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to our first speaker, Zoe Dunning, who will talk to you about her experience in and around and after the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy in the U.S. military. Thank you, Dean Hillman. Um, I always joke when they say we want you to come to a panel and speak to the historical context of uh, whatever the topic is. It just makes me feel a little old, but perhaps I'm sensitive since I turned 50. Um, so uh, as 
she intimated in my biography, um, I've been personally impacted by the policies around don't ask, don't tell, um, and the policy prior to it. When I entered the military, the policy was simply, you know, you just can't be gay. Um, and they would actively investigate you and witch hunt and, and attempt to kick you out. Um, it was a very stressful experience, a stressful life. Um, every day you weren't sure whether that was the day that you were going to be found out and that you were going to lose your college education or lose your job or whatever it might be. So um, I became active in the issue when President-elect Clinton declared that he was going to change the policy on gays in the military. I came out publicly in support of him and uh, as a result went through my discharge proceedings and uh, was this sort of weird exception and was allowed to continue to serve openly in the military. Um, that could be a whole other panel about what that was all like. But um, that began sort of my advocacy on the issue and uh, became involved with Service Members Legal Defense Network, which uh, Jeff is now the co-chair of. Um, but I think, you know, when we talk about LGBTQ issues around the military and, and for veterans, um, one of the things that I think is really unique is, is that military experience. I know I do a lot of public speaking at, you know, American Legion posts and veterans organizations, and someone may have only served one or two years in the military or three years, um, but it is that common experience that sort of binds them together and um, it becomes their primary social circle. It just becomes a really critical part of, of your existence and your identity and who you are. So when you have policies around gays and lesbians in the military, it's, it's, a, it's almost a different plane than just regular employment or regular t you know, schools or whatever it might be. Um, I heard an expression once that I really liked uh, and resonated with me, it said that um, a veteran is someone who at one point in their life walks into a recruiter's office and signs a blank check to the American people payable up to and including their own life. And that's a pretty severe commitment. That's a pretty serious um, obligation that people who enter the military um, give. And so I think we really owe people who serve as, as well as veterans, you know, we owe them something for that commitment, for that service. And so that's why it's very important to me um, to allow the military to um, provide opportunity for everyone who's qualified, LGBT, um, as well as treat our veterans uh, well. And so I think this concept of, you know, when the war comes home, when people come home, how we treat them, I think reflects how we treat people in general in society, you know, how, how we treat our veterans, I think um, translates for that. Um, I know we're going to have an active Q&A and conversation, so I'll look forward to some more of that. But I think for me personally, um, um, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell was a critical period of time for the LGBT movement. Um, I think where the military goes, society goes. We, I think we've seen that time and again when it comes to um, battling discrimination, whether it's African Americans or, or uh, opportunities for women. I mean, the military can be that sort of head of the spear that opens things up. And I think we've seen it in terms of LGBT rights. Once Don't Ask, Don't Tell is repealed, suddenly a lot more states, you know, marriage rights and DOMA and all of these other things kind of fell into place because, again, how we treat our military oftentimes has um, ripple effects throughout society. So um, to me, it's very interesting to continue to study the military and how it evolves because I think it is a precursor to society at large. Thank you. So now we'll ask Aaron Belkin to talk to us about uh, some of his most recent work, which involves transgender rights in the military. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you to the audience and the other panelists. It's really an honor to serve with you on the panel um, and the organizers of the event. Um, I want to echo um, one thing that um, Zoe Dunning, Command uh, Commander Dunning, said about the importance of the military for broader social rights uh, in non-military contexts. Um, having been involved in the campaign to um, repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell for more than a decade, I realized that, that people who opposed openly gay service, and we'll get to transgender in a second, but people who opposed openly gay service, in many cases weren't so focused on the military and didn't really care so much about the question of gay troops, but they realized that what Zoe just said was right, that don't ask, don't tell was a line in the sand, if you will, and that once that line in the sand was eliminated or, or crossed, that um, gays and lesbians would be able to lock in our citizenship rights in other realms, and that until that line is crossed, uh, we'd never be able to do so. And in fact, 
um, studies um, discuss the ways in which going back 2,000 years in, in, in most societies, one of the markers that distinguishes first-class citizens from everybody else is the right to serve in the military. So, so people who opposed um, openly gay service were exactly right to do so from their, uh, from their uh, moral point of view about opposing gay rights more generally. So in terms of um, the question of transgender service in the military, uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was a statute, a congressional law, that didn't address gender identity. And so when, uh, when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed uh, by Congress, the regulations that prohibit transgender individuals from serving remained in place. But those rules are just that, they're rules, they're not laws. And so the president, as commander in chief, could get rid of those rules with a stroke of the pen. One thing that's interesting about that is that in the case of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, it was very clear to everybody working on that issue that we were really pushing against a brick wall because it's so hard to move Congress, and that's why it took 20 years uh, to get the policy change. And even when we had a sympathetic Congress and White House, it still took two years, and we still almost didn't get across the line. But with transgender service, on the one hand, you can make some really smart arguments that, again, we're pushing against a brick wall, and it's going to take years and years and years um, to change the policy. But I think the better evidence um, lines up behind the idea that, um, that we may actually be pushing against a house of cards. And for the 14,500 transgender troops who are serving now, I think there's a very good chance that the Pentagon will update its policies relatively sooner rather than relatively later. I'll say one more thing and then um, uh, hand the floor over to, um, to, to Jeff, um, which is that, interestingly, the, um, the opponents to uh, openly gay service, um, they lied about, they lied about, well, they lied about everything. A lot. Um, <laughs> They just lied all over the place. Um, and one thing they lied about is that in many cases their motives were really ground in um, whatever you want to call it, homophobia, moral animus, intolerance, what have you. But they couldn't admit in public that their support for federal law was ground in personal animus. And so they came up with a phony argument about unit cohesion that if gays were allowed to serve openly that would prevent the troops from bonding with each other and the military would fall apart. Um, seriously. Um, the, the transgender policies, uh, unlike Don't Ask, Don't Tell, are, are articulated in medical regulations. And so the rules that prohibit transgender people from serving uh, um, say that, uh, well, there's a psychological piece of the transgender ban and a physical piece. So you're not allowed to have a transgender identity and you're not allowed to change your genitals. So there are two pieces to the ban. Um, um, but, they're, but they're justified by medical arguments um, that suggest that providing health care to transgender troops would just be beyond the military's com uh, competence. Uh, those arguments, just like the don't ask, don't tell arguments, are lies, but they're medical lies. They're not lies about military performance. So um, we can talk more about in uh, Q&A about how to get rid of this policy, but that's, that's kind of where we are for now. Thanks, Aaron. Jeff? Uh, thank you, Dean Hillman. Uh, it's very humbling to be, be on a panel with two individuals that fought so that I could be here today. So I, I thank the two of them for all the work that they have done and, and for passing the torch of sorts. And, and I hope I can, I can make you two proud as, as we go forward with, with all the work that there is still to be done. Um, I got involved with, with OutServe, uh, which before the merger of the two organizations, um, did have a little little input into into the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. They realized that the active duty military did not have a voice in trying to get the repeal to happen because if we said something, then we'd no longer be active duty. So there was an organization founded to try to gather that voice and, and using non-military personnel pass the stories uh, out to the general public and to the Pentagon and to Congress about this unit you know, cohesion stuff really wasn't true and that you know, this is the way that we needed to move. Um, started as, as a face, the underground Facebook social organization um, and, and very quickly built up to, you know, having quite a few members 
uh, in, in chat rooms and talking and, and a great force group behind that. As you know, we won the first victory of getting Donast on Tell repealed, uh, obviously OutServe had worked very closely with Service Members Legal Defense Network. Some sort of partnership or eventually merger seemed to make sense because you know we had the active duty LGBT troops, SLDN had the, the historical perspective, and so the two organizations came together. Um, and today, our focus turns a little bit from the advocacy piece. We, we are still working, you know, there are still some issues that, that, that we can get into later that, that we need to kind of address, but uh, there are still LGBT military members out there actively serving, and they go through all stages of life. They go through all stages of, of needing support that is different than their straight counterparts. You know, are they coming out? Are they coming out to their commanders? Do they have certain issues that they need to be addressed? And so there is still a need for, uh, for a social support network. Uh, and so we continue to provide that and as well continue to advocate for uh, the continued rights, you know, one, the transgender service piece, um, you know, trying to utilize the resources that we have to, to work with the Palm Center to, to move that forward, um, as well as equal opportunity and non-discrimination. Uh, kind of seeing trends that I've seen over the last six to eight months, there's been a little bit of an increase in that towards our LGBT uh, service members, uh, all kinds of varying things going on in, in that realm. I mean, it, it's very kind of specific on where the individual is, you know, what service they're in, as to what kind of issues that they're dealing with. Um, and I think what it comes down to, and, and, and one of the ways that we can kind of roll this all together to really move things forward is, is education. As we go through Pride Month, and the Department of Defense for the first time ever designated June of 2014 as an official Pride Month, the kickoff celebration at the Pentagon was today. I'm seeing, yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, um, I'm seeing base installations uh, around, the, around the world, really, putting together Pride programs. You know, we, we think of Pride, we think of, okay, let's have the parade, let's have, you know, all, all the fun that goes with that. That's not what's happening. It's programs. It's local chapter leaders within OutServe SLDN going to their base leadership and saying, I want to put something together. They're doing 5K fun runs. They're, they're doing an hour-long educational seminar um, to educate you know, base leadership or uh, you know, just people in general about still the issues that are facing LGBT military members. And so this education piece is we can educate commanders, we can educate those that, that still believe the lies that are out there. Um, is I think what's going to continue to change the hearts and minds. And so that's a lot of the work that we're trying to focus on right now as an organization to continue that education piece so that people really understand it's not a big deal. You know, we're, we're, we're serving right alongside everybody else. We've written that blank check no matter what our gender identity or no matter what our sexual orientation is, um, and we want to continue to serve. So, um, you know, there's still some work to be done, and in my opinion, there will always be a need to have, have a support network. Um, and so that's, you know, that's why we exist to continue to support our LGBT troops in whatever manner that, that we need to. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to start with a question that Aaron reminded me of here. Um, he mentioned medical lies. I always thought there were three kinds of lies, right? Lies, damn lies, and statistics. <laughs> <clears throat> now we have to add medical lies to that. But let's go back to number three on statistics because we are in the era of big data and the numbers are, are a lot of the truth for many of us now and how things get presented. I wonder what numbers matter as we look at the what's happening with LGBT service members and veterans, and what numbers should we be paying attention to in this? Jeff mentioned numbers you think of maybe harassment and uh, have, have increased. I wondered, what, what do you think we should be paying attention to in this next era? So, and Aaron, since you started with a number out there, 14,500 <laughs> transgender service members serving today. So where does that number come from? Is that, is that important to us, and what else should we be paying attention to? Um. I can walk you through the math of where that comes from. Uh, so uh, Gary Gates and Jody Herman, two scholars at UCLA, um, looked at survey data that showed that about 20% of transgender Americans are veterans. And there are about 700,000 transgender adults in the US. And 20% of that uh, is about 140,000, actually found about 135,000 transgender veterans. So they start with that number. And that, by the way, it is, shows that about that transgender individuals are about twice as likely to serve as non-transgender individuals. What they do 
um, with that number of veterans is they take a, they make a ratio because among non-transgender Americans, we know what ratio there is between active duty service members and veterans. And so they apply that same ratio to the number of transgender veterans and you get about 10% of that is 14,500. So for each service member serving currently, there are about 10 veterans for, for both transgender and non-transgender. So are there other important numbers that we should know about the struggle for transgender rights? I mean, that's a recognition. There are an awful lot of more people in uniform who are transgender than most people would assume. Well, I, I mean, I, my emphasis is on that number to begin with, and, and it's been interesting to watch as media coverage of transgender military service has um, uh, amplified in the last month or so. It's, it's actually been a very important month. They have really focused on that number that Dr. Gates and Dr. Herman came up with, and I think the reason for that is because many Americans aren't aware that there are any transgender service members. And so <laughs> to talk about 14,500 people serving loyally, not being able to access health care, being subject to discharge if they tell the truth about who they are, not being able to report abuse when they're abused because they could get discovered as transgender, um, to know that there are 14,500 people in that situation, I think, is, is very compelling. Thanks, Aaron. Other ideas about numbers? So, so you brought up the, the sexual assault, and I mean, it might sound cliche, but one sexual assault is, is one too many. And, and while I think numbers, like, like Aaron said, kind of bring awareness to where we're at, um, you know, having, having just gone through our, our annual sexual assault prevention response training within the Air Force, uh, you know, they threw the slide up there of, of how many cases there were last year compared to the year before. And those numbers don't do any good because as there's more awareness risen to this topic, the numbers are gonna increase. So what do you do with that? Um, it's not a very meaningful statistic. I mean, you know, talk about you know, the type of lies and that it's not a meaningful statistic and you know, how often is it happening? And so it's, it's difficult to put a number on that. It's even harder to put a number on uh, same sex or uh, sexual assaults or sexual assaults that affect our LGBT military members. I mean, it, it's almost literally impossible because part of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell was that the Department of Defense was not going to track in any way, shape, or form sexual orientation and, of course, by default, gender identity. So there's no statistics within the DOD for that. Um, and, you know, maybe I, I was just thinking I need to talk to Aaron to get a study going to try to figure that out. But um, I don't know that, at least talking about the sexual assault piece of it, that other than knowing that there's a large amount of these happening, that the numbers are as important. I think it's more, look, it's happening. Even within my, my training, the emphasis was on male to female sexual assault, which is still an important issue and still something we have to address, but they didn't really touch male to male, female to female, female to male. Um, all four are happening, and that's what we need to try to get rid of and educate people that it's happening and how can we prevent these sorts of situations. So numbers can help, but again, I'm gonna go back to the education and trying to correct the problem as opposed to just pushing numbers out there to, to try to get to where we need to be with it. And I would just say that one of the statistics that I often cite, a lot of people at the time thought that Clinton's compromise around don't ask, don't tell was, you know, sort of a step forward or it was, you know, a partial solution or it was an improvement of some sort. And in reality, actually, it was worse because it, shone, it sh shined a light on LGBT service members, um, LGBT ser service members, and um, caused a lot of investigations and things like that. So the number I often cite is 13,000. So during the course of the Don't Ask, Don't Tell policy, over 13,000 service members were discharged. That doesn't count the people who chose not to enter the military because they didn't want to serve under the policy. It didn't count those who chose not to re-enlist or to renew or continue their career because they got tired of serving under that. But 13,000 people were discharged for um, uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And the other thing that was interesting is that the number of discharges increased every single year from 1994, I believe is when it was actually implemented, um, up until 2001. And then we started the war. And guess what? Suddenly the discharges went down every year once we went to war because they started to look the other way and we need qualified troops. And um, when that happens, we're not so aggressive in uh, investigating and discharging people. But Beth, why did you want to know about numbers? 
Because I think they're the lens through which uh, we decide what's important in many respects, and I think it's true for in this arena too. I'm, I'm also struck by the, the tipping points in that military sexual uh, assault realm, the numbers have been the drivers of some policy that has happened. And Jeff is right, as he points out, that the, uh, the, the, the numbers of reports increasing is not necessarily a sign of the uh, problem increasing in any particular demographic group or community. And yet, it's pretty tough to say we feel good about an increase in the number of reports. Um, but it's a recognition of the, the difficulty of that problem. So I have a, a question for you about how the um, how these changes have come to be and what made a difference in changing things. Because it did take a long time to undo Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And Aaron, you mentioned that toppling that unit cohesion argument made a difference in this. Um, what are the uh, external factors, uh, the, the things that really mattered, and what are the barriers now to, that, we, that we have to look ahead to, to get around or, or to get over in order to get to the next level here? Um. That's a really tough question to answer because so many uh, uh, people and groups were doing so many things to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And the, the way I think about it is that there were, there were kind of five strategic baskets or sets of activities that different groups were pursuing. There were, and, different, and some groups were doing more than one, pursuing more than one strategy. But, but one important strategy was, uh, was lobbying and educating Congress and going door to door and literally building support one member of Congress at a time. And SLDN did incredible work in that way. A second was, uh, especially in the end game, grassroots organizing, which um, OutServe was so important. And uh, HRC did some of that with uh, service members throughout America going and having meetings with their local communities and putting letters in local newspapers. Um, and then there was um, public education, um, which uh, the Palm Center uh, and other groups were involved with, um, which involved um, explaining to the public uh, why, uh, uh, why the unit cohesion rationale was false and why, uh, why um, gays and lesbians could serve uh, uh, honorably and not undermine the military. Um, and then other strategies too, some, some litigation, legal defense, and other things. But it was, a, it was a combination of strategies. And I think that you know, we didn't always have coordination among our groups. But, but as a movement, I think we did about as well as any activist community could be expected to do. And, uh, um, and I, was really, I was really proud of the whole community for that. So moving forward on, on transgender, I think it's going to take the same strategies. And we talk about non-discrimination and knowing that gender identity and sexual orientation are still not written to the Department of Defense's uh, equal opportunity non-discrimination clauses. Again, I think it is a similar strategy, something that I kind of, I've seen as a, you know, not a lie to go against it, but, uh, oh, it's a, it's, it's a protection that you don't really need. It, it, it's different than gender. It's different than race. Um, why should we add you to that? Um, and so I think that's something that's a mindset that we need to kind of change to understand that no, it, it's not really that different at all. And we just need to make it a common thing so that people kind of look at it no differently than they do from any of the other protected classes within non-discrimination. And so it just becomes no big deal and we can add it in there and it will hopefully help um, because, you know, we're seeing still the discrimination against uh, LGBT military members and there's not a whole lot of recourse for them. Um, how many of you knew the Department of Defense has a human rights charter? They do. And it was just updated. And it's a charter signed by the Secretary of Defense and the update was to include sexual orientation. Great step forward. It, it should include gender identity as well, but what does that mean? What does that do? You know, we were having a conversation kind of beforehand. It's not a directive. It's not an instruction. It's really not enforceable. Great step forward. It's part of a strategy to kind of get there, but my next step would be, great, let's update the non-discrimination clause, um, or let's, let's update it to include gender identity. Um, so it's these little things that we kind of need to continue to move forward so that it becomes I don't want to say commonplace because that makes it seem not important, but I mean, I think you understand what I'm saying about it's, just, it's no big deal. Kind of like the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell was going to be the end of the world. If you ask, I don't even remember her name now, Elaine Donnelly, if you ask her, it was the end of the world. Sorry, I had to mention the name, but, um, and it was a non-issue, just like 
all these other issues that we're facing, if, if we get to where we want to be, it really is a non-issue in the sense of it's, it's going to make our military even better, not weaken it in any way, shape, or form. And I'll, I'll just add, so um, I, I sometimes do these panels, and um, my friends joke about, like, you know, you're a professional lesbian. And I was like, well, if only I got paid for it. Um, <laughs> so a lot of the stuff I do kind of, you know, volunteerism and trying to spread the word. My paid job is that I actually do what's called change management consulting. So I work with large organizations that are going through a major change like a merger acquisition or a reorg or a you know, big computer system implementation. And you kind of help them through that change um, and involves you know, stakeholder engagement and communication and training and impact assessment and things like that. And I look at the way the Obama administration actually carried out the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and it hits like every single change management principle you can imagine. And it's almost like the exact opposite of what Clinton did. Um, you know, Clinton was just kind of like sort of force it upon folks. And it obviously, as you can tell, didn't work out very well. But the way the Obama administration did it, um, you know, in terms of getting the most senior leadership of the Pentagon on board before trying to push it forward anymore. Um, trying to do an assessment of what the impact was. So they did a survey of all the troops before they did it to understand where the attitudes were, what the issues were, what the concerns were. Um, they did a, a lot of communication within the military to help them understand what it was going to happen, when it was going to happen, how it was going to happen. Um, and then there was a training. And so every single member of the military, and I think you went through it, had to go through training about you know um, what it meant to serve alongside gays, even though they face were face to all, face training. It wasn't an online thing. Yeah, it, was, it had to be like in person training about thing. like you know you're going to be serving alongside gays now, and it's like, well, no, I already am serving alongside <laughs> gays. Um, I just you know know it now for a fact as opposed to a hunch. Um, <laughs> so. Um, and really what the, most of the training ended up being was just about respect. That's all it really was. It was like, you know, if you're going to serve alongside someone, you know, leadership is about respect. It's about respecting individuals, it's respecting people, and, and, that, and if we treat them with respect, then you've got nothing really to worry about in the implementation of don't ask, don't tell. So I think that that was really key in the implementation, and I think the lessons that we learned from that um, will be useful, I think, as we try to address things like benefits or transgender um, uh, integration, well, uh, recognition of and um, ability for transgender troops to join and, and stay in the service. So let's talk about benefits, uh, since that's a big issue for veterans and also for service members. And it's something that's changed significantly with the end of the Defense of Marriage Act, as well uh, as the end of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. But one of the reasons that uh, was raised in opposition to Don't Ask, Don't Tell was the economic argument. This would, this would be more expensive because we'd need to care for persons, the families of, of uh, service members, for instance, who would have access to benefits. Um, and we've seen in recent weeks here how intense the, um, the challenges are to providing benefits to, uh, to veterans and how difficult the administration of that has proven, even with lots of resources actually being dedicated to that, to that process and lots of efforts to manage the change in administration of those benefits. So I, I wonder, where do we stand with, with um, service members, active duty service members, access to benefits? And where do we stand with veterans' access to, to equality in terms of benefits? So speaking for active duty service members, it's for, for, from a benefits perspective of, of what you get as a legally married same-sex couple, um, it is exactly the same from the perspective of if you are a legally married same-sex couple, you get access to absolutely everything that legally married straight couples get. Um, where a little bit of the difference is, is that LGBT people can't get married in every single state across the country. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy there. Uh, the way the department handled that was to create a policy that became very vague and did not include sexual orientation um, in it. Obviously, gender identity is not a player in this because it's, it's still a bar to service. Um, Anybody, if you could not get legally married in the state in which you lived, you could get uh, non-chargeable leave, so you wouldn't have to take vacation to go get married somewhere. Obviously, that only applies to, to lesbian gays because straight people can get married in any state, barring some, you know, you can't marry your, your brother or cousin kind of thing. Um, <laughs> So they implement that, and there's all kinds of math rules about the closest state, and you get to travel day, whatever, and, and it's, it, 
as the military loves to make you know things complicated but so that's that's one little difference um and and from what we've been seeing that has been it was slow to roll out but the implementation of that non-chargeable leave has been enacted pretty fairly so you get leave for your honeymoon too no, no. Well, so that's interesting because that was the, the critic said, oh, well, you're just giving them honeymoon leave. Because initially it was, oh, you can take, I think it was 10 days or five or 10 days of, of well, near force permissive TDY, but non-chargeable leave. And so the critics were saying, oh, well, you know, that's a honeymoon leave, you know, and no, it's, it's not. No, we don't. Um, so that's why they did this mileage rule anyway. So it, it, it's fairly enacted, I, I think. But um, veterans benefits are a whole separate ball of wax. Um, unfortunately, the Department of Veterans Affairs has not come out with a sweeping policy as to how to address LGBT veterans benefits, and they are not being handled equally across states, across where people go. We are slowly getting there, but the department obviously has other issues to deal with, not that this is not important, but there are other things that they need to focus on. Well, there are other things they are dealing with. Um, and we're slowly starting to see veterans benefits roll in for LGBT service member uh, veterans. Um, there's still claims that are being denied for for whatever benefit that is they're trying to, to get to. Um, and that's one thing that we're trying to, to work to equalize that because it's not fair that it's not happening uh, across the board. Outserve SLDN partners quite a bit with the American Veterans for Equal Rights or AVER. Um, who, who does focus a lot more on, on the veterans issues. Um, and we've been in discussions with them as well as the uh, um, Military Partners Family Coalition about how can we ensure that the next incoming uh, Secretary of Veterans Affairs is going to understand and treat fairly LGBT veterans. Um, and we're still formulating a strategy as to how our organizations can, can vet pretty much the new uh, the new secretary and so we're, we're trying to figure out how that strategy can go forward so that we can make sure that all of our veterans are being treated equally because um, as the president said at West Point and the vice president said at the Air Force Academy uh, to these cadets that are about ready to sign that blank check you go serve your country and we'll take care of you for the rest of your life we want that to happen obviously especially for our LGBT um, veterans and it's not you know, it's not happening for all veterans, and so what can we do to make sure that we change that? And that's a struggle because the LGBT part is a small piece of, obviously, the very bigger issues that the, the Department of Veterans Affairs is having to deal with. So not an easy thing to kind of swallow, but it is definitely on our radar um, and definitely something that we're, we're actively trying to find a, a solution as to how we can, we can get, to that, get there. And I think one of the challenges as well is around health care benefits for veterans, um, transgender health care. Um, I think the San Francisco VA is probably light years ahead of almost every other VA hospital. Um, I think Palo Alto might be up there as well. I'm, I don't have as much direct knowledge, but uh, I mean, think about the transgender veteran who's, you know, not to pick on the Midwest because I'm from the Midwest, but, um, you know, who's in Kansas or something and the nearest VA center is probably their practitioners aren't very skilled necessarily in what the healthcare challenges are for a transgender veteran. So um, that's also, I think, a, a huge area for improvement and opportunity. I know the VA is you know, trying to start to address it, but it, it's still a long way to go. Well, actually, the, the VA does, I mean, this might be one area in which policy is more advanced for T than for LGB because the, um, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs does have guidance, 2011 guidance, that clearly commits it to providing mm -hmm. um, outstanding and equal um, uh, health care to transgender veterans, except for the question of surgery. Um, and they've put in place, uh, now we can talk about how effective they are, but they have put in place with good faith a series of mechanisms to try to ensure that um, doctors throughout the VA system and providers throughout the VA system, if they don't have competence, that they'll at least know where to get competence um, when it comes up. Um, but, but yes, I, I, I agree there's, there's more to go, especially on the surgery, surgery question. So one thing, Jeff mentioned the, uh, the leave that's been allocated for service members who are in places where they can't legally get married. The Army used to say that if they wanted you to have a wife, they would issue, issue you one. one. <laughs> Um, this change in actually the structure of the military comes through the all-volunteer force. I mean, we no longer have a conscript armed force that is composed of non-volunteers um, as well as volunteers. That 
that um, self-selection into military service has changed who's in the service and who's not. And I wonder how you think that who serves in the military today affects how these rights roll out. And specifically, let me go to a somewhat controversial piece of this. What about the evangelical presence within the armed forces? Um, that's been uh, a source of uh, resistance to some of the movements to grant rights to LGBT service members and veterans as well. And I wonder what evidence you've seen of that or interaction or what you, how you see the military dealing with that challenge. I can speak to kind of something we haven't touched base with, but um, from the evangelical side of it and some of the pushback uh, within the services the chaplain corps provides to, to our service members, um, that's probably the biggest issue or the biggest area where that kind of evangelical presence can really cause a lot of pushback. Um, and there's a couple issues that, that go into that. You have the chaplains that because of their, um, now I can't remember the term, but whoever, in, their endorser, uh, does not allow them to provide certain services to LGBT service members. So they they would lose their endorsement and lose their ability to be a chaplain if they oversaw a same-sex wedding or even provided counseling to a same-sex couple. They, they just physically can't do it because of, of, of who is, has endorsed them. Now, granted, they can change endorsers if it's, if it's a belief they have. Um, but at the same time, there is a movement within the chapel court to kind of move away from providing religious services. So, you know, in the past it had been, okay, that the chaplains on an installation, you know, they do the, the Protestant service, the Catholic service, the, the Jewish service, or whatever it may be. And that was one of their main functions. At least within the Air Force, there has been a movement where uh, it's not so much the services, but providing care to the, the troops. So rather than worrying about, I'm going to give you your mass every Sunday, um, we're going to go out and make sure that you're doing okay. We're going to provide you counseling. We're going to, um, you know, provide marriage retreats. And there's been a lot of discussion within the chapel corps as to how you handle the evangelical presence for people that don't want to provide the services um, to LGBT service members. And basically, a lot of what it has come down to is our goal as a chaplain corps is to provide service to all troops, no matter what. And if a chaplain cannot do that, then they need to remove themselves from the situation and find somebody that can, not just have them walk out the door. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a struggle within the chaplain court to do that. Obviously, that's a very extreme example, I think, but I think it's, it's a decent representation because chaplains are such a big part of the military, especially with our deployed troops overseas. And as they start to coming home and all the issues that they're gonna be dealing with, counseling, uh, PTSD, what, you know, their transition possibly out of the military, the chaplain corps is going to be a very instrumental part in ensuring that their transition, whether it be to a non-wartime military job or um, becoming veterans in a civilian job, that's going to be a very critical part. So we're getting there with, with the way that that's handled. Um, there's still some work to be done, but there are a lot of advocates even within the chaplain corps uh, for, for that to happen. I'm curious, are they weighing in at all on the transgender issue? Um, I haven't seen anything yet. Okay. Yeah, um, so, I would I would say though, um, on this issue, I'm I'm very worried about um, the way that some religious denominations are relating to their military service. And during the campaign to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I I did about um, I gave about thirty lectures at military universities, um, and. And the behavior was just out of control. And the, the way that um, some evangelical officers would put pressure on their subordinates to go to church um, with obvious professional implications if they didn't, um, clear use of the military to proselytize, demands by the chaplains to be able to invoke the name of Jesus Christ at compulsory military ceremonies while on the federal uh, uh, dime uh, for their salaries, and 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 the list goes on and on. And in fact, there's even a watchdog group whose only job is to is to look out for religious scandals in the military, and they find lots of them. Um, so I am very worried about religion in the military, but I am not worried um, about what I think you were gesturing at with your question: the notion that um, people of faith would leave the military. Um, as a result of inclusion. Um, there, I, I mean, there are so many groups that, in theory, dislike each other. I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't know how 
evangelicals feel about Wiccans or atheists or you know other other people um, in the military. But 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 if everyone left the military because there was someone else in the military they didn't like, then there would be no military. And so, um, and in fact, I'll say one more thing about this. But Elaine Donnelly, um, I think one of the only um, good well good, one of the only strategically uh, sophisticated things that she did um, was to get a group of about a thousand retired generals and admirals to uh, to sign a statement that said that the all volunteer army would quote unquote be destroyed um, uh, or sorry that, that that allowing gays to serve openly would break the all volunteer army because uh, people would leave and the implication was people of faith would leave. Uh, if gays were allowed to serve openly, and um, and it just didn't happen, uh, there was there was no decline in recruiting or retention or any 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 metrics after um, after repeal. And I would say the same thing is going to happen after transgender inclusion takes place. To pick on that very big back on that very quickly, I I, I agree with what he just said. Um, you know, being an openly gay. Uh, individuals serving within the military and having friends and, and subordinates and superiors and coworkers that are of all all faith backgrounds, knowing that some of them, because of their faith, may not agree with um, me being gay, it hasn't affected anything at all. And I think it goes back to kind of the opening sentiment that we're all in the military. You know, we all chose to do this profession of arms, and we took an oath, and we are going to be professional. And by and large, I see that happening. You know, there are obviously isolated incidents where that doesn't happen, but we're all professionals and we're going to uphold that. The list that you referenced, I think they did some analysis on these thousand generals and admirals and flag officers who had written that the demise of the military was imminent if we should repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And um, I think the average age was. 74 or something and, and there are actually I think a couple dead people on the list too there were, but but you know how so our side actually put together a group of about a hundred uh, generals and admirals calling for the repeal of don't ask don't tell and I, I so I think it was was it SLDN that found out that the age of the of the generals on the other side and and I think there was some uh, inclination to to kind of advertise that but then we did an age analysis of our generals and admirals and they were really old too okay <laughs> so, so. I guess this happens to be yeah. retired admirals and generals are just old in yeah. general yeah. so you're not old oh thank you yes relatively speaking I guess I'm pretty young <laughs> So let, let's talk a little bit about um, being outspoken on these issues and what impact it's, um, you expect it to have or it has had. So Jeff, are you a captain right now? Uh, I'm a major now. You're a major, yeah, a major in the Air Force. It's, okay. yeah, I, it's not in your bio here, so we're, we're calling you Jeff and not Captain Mueller or Major Mueller. So, um, so the, um, not long ago, you could not have done this. Um, now you're actually outspoken on an issue. That's an unusual profile for a military officer to take, to be outspoken on a public issue that still generates significant political fire. Likewise, Commander Dunning, unusual to be an officer, a serving military officer who has been outspoken on an issue that remains not only um, not unresolved, but resolved against you, actually, sort of in the uh, in in policy and law at the time. So how did how how did that affect you, and and how do you anticipate that affecting you as you go forward? Um, it it was interesting. I mean, I think when I first came out publicly, and I went to my I was a reservist, and so I, I was stationed at Naval Air Station Alameda. Came out publicly. It was in the paper. I reported for duty the next weekend, and they informed me that legal wanted to see me. Um, Big surprise, right? Um, but what I found interesting is that my colleagues, um, it wasn't so much, <laughs> just once I'd like to come out to someone and have them go, no, not you. Um, so it wasn't like it was a huge surprise, I think, to my unit members. Um, but I think uh, they were, they felt almost like I was being disloyal to the organization. I was being disloyal to the military. The fact that I hadn't gone through my chain of command, the fact that I had been public about it, um, they felt like I was trying to shame the military. And really what I was trying to do was shame a policy that I felt was making the military weaker. So it wasn't like I was trying to make the military weaker and shame it. I was trying to make it stronger by shaming this policy that I felt was um, uh, undermining it. And um, so their reaction was very, really very much more about like, why would you risk your career? You know, why are you trying to shame the military? And once I sat down and I got like an, 
you know, on your fitness report, it goes from, it doesn't, it isn't just like A, B, C, D, it goes down to like F, G, H. I mean, they use like half the alphabet um, in terms of the grades that you can get on your fitness reports. And I got like an F or a G in um, uh, judgment um, <laughs> shortly after I came out. Um, and I knew that that would be a career killer. I knew that if that ever went into my record that I'd, I'd never advance. Um, so I went uh, to the commanding officer and I kind of explained to him, I sat down with one-on-one -on -one with him and I explained why I came out what it was like to be gay under the policy. And he understood, and he went back and did a corrective letter and ended up giving me an A in judgment. And in fact, actually testified on my behalf at my discharge hearing. Um, so that's what I found is that people kind of would react, but then when you sat down and had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, then the light would turn on and they'd be like, oh, okay, now I understand why you're advocating for this. I didn't realize it was that difficult. And um, one of the reasons I chose to become an advocate around it was the fact that everyone could talk about it except for those who were serving. Um, you know, the media was talking about it, the Pentagon was talking about it, Congress was talking about it. The only people who couldn't say anything were those who were actually impacted by the policy. So um, that was part of my impetus for coming out. And I used to joke that, you know, I don't know how many of you remember 93 and that whole year, first year of Clinton's office when this was like such a big issue. and. You know, all the media was like, men, showers, showers, men, men, showers, men, showers, men, showers. That's like all they cared about. <laughs> and I was like, you know, the lesbians must be dry cleaned because um, <laughs> there's never a mention of women in this entire debate. So that was another part of my impetus was to sort of bring a female voice to the conversation. You know, it was like the LGBT. Um, and so, so anyway, I would just say it, it's challenging. Um, you get sort of a group, like, why are you doing this? But then when you talk one-on-one -on -one with people, they, they, they tend to get it. Um, also, ironically, I had two discharge hearings. I had one under the policy prior to Don't Ask, Don't Tell, because I came out three days before uh, Clinton was inaugurated. Um, but then, and they voted unanimously to kick me out. Um, but then, while they were processing me for discharge, Clinton announced Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So I was like, well, this was so much fun, let's do it again. Um, <laughs> and I had a second discharge hearing in, in one of the very first Don't Ask, Don't Tell cases and um, was unanimously voted to be retained. Um, but between those two discharge hearings, I actually received a letter notifying me that I was promoted to lieutenant commander. So at the same time they were trying to kick me out, um, they were also promoting me. Um, so eventually I did get promoted to commander. I don't think I ever um, was really considered seriously for captain just because of my advocacy. I think there was a little bit of a um, pink glass ceiling there. Um, but generally people treated me with a lot of respect. Um, I think they admired that I was acting on my beliefs. Um, they were a little nervous about it. They were nervous about my career. They were nervous I was trying to shame the military. But overall, I think the reception was, was, was pretty good. So from my perspective, I mentioned earlier, it, it's no big deal. And so my intention on repeal day was just to show up to work and the weight was lifted off my shoulders. That's, that's kind of the way I wanted it to happen. It didn't so much go that way. And, and looking back, I'm glad, and, and here's the story. So because of my work with OutServe, um, I was asked to do a bunch of interviews that would run on repeal day. And I actually had done an interview prior to the repeal within Colorado Springs. Um, where my face was blacked out on, on a local TV station. And so I did a follow-up interview with that, and then also the Denver Post interviewed me, um, actually from my hotel room in Frankfurt, Germany, while I was on a, on a work trip over there doing some work for the Missile Defense Agency. And so on repeal day, not only did my story run in the front page of the Denver Post, um, also some, a radio station and a couple other uh, local TV stations ran the story as well. And so I... The day of repeal was my first day back at work and I had just flown in the night before and I was not at work at seven o'clock. And I got a phone call from my office phone and it was one of the contractors that worked for me that had been in the army and she's like, Jeff, I think I just added you at work. Today, Rachel, I, I don't care. And she found the story and didn't link the name. I don't know how many major Jeff Mueller's there are in the state of Colorado, but um, she forwarded the story to a bunch of people at work and it very quickly got passed around and when they actually saw the photograph on the second page they're like oh, oh that's him and so my colonel at the time uh, got wind of it. it it got to him and he was actually geographically separated in Alabama and he went and called my civilian boss who was a, a government civilian and, and Colonel Mitchell was asking Frank Frank did, did you 
know about this? And Frank was one of the individuals I had confided in before the repeal. And, and Frank said, well, y yes, sir, I did. And, and kind of the way uh, Zoe said, Colonel Mitchell got all in a huff and said, well, well, Frank, why didn't you tell me about this? I need to know about this stuff. And Frank kind of said, sir, I don't know what you don't get about don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> Um, so, for, you know, in one of my feedback sessions, you know, he actually kind of brought it up and he said, oh, Jeff, I know this is a sticky topic. And I'm like, well, no, sir, it's not. And, and he wanted to make sure everything was going well, and, and it was. But the second part of the story is, um, and, and I, I am not all about, oh, I'm a major, I have high rank, I don't care about that. That's not why I serve in the military. But being a field grade officer within the Air Force, and you've got 18 and 20 year old airmen that are now seeing me in the news and, and as someone they can, they can advocate for this, it gives them the comfort that says, oh, okay, this is okay. I can come out to my commander. I at least know that it's okay and there are people out there trying to help me. That was never my intention from the get-go, but it was a, a, you know, what, what ended up happening because of, because of the way I did it. And I continue to see that as I you know, talk to people and, and you know, obviously being very, very involved with the active duty service members. So from that perspective, I'm glad it wasn't just another day in my life. Um, you know, if I can impact one other individual, let alone many more, to know that, yeah, it is okay, and yeah, you can serve, and there are people out there that have your back, that's, that's kind of what it's all about, so. Thank you. I don't know if you all have any questions for us, but if you do, you should write them on those cards. And Here we'll, come the note cards. Um, we'll be happy to try to answer them. While we're pulling those up, let me just ask Aaron to talk about what these last few weeks have been for the transgender rights movement in the military, because things have happened very fast recently. Yeah. Um, I think we're at the beginning of the end of this policy um, all of a sudden. And uh, what happened is this. Um, there was a report released by a, uh, a former Surgeon General um, who looked at the military's medical rationale for firing transgender troops and found that the rationale didn't make any sense. There was no good medical science behind the transgender ban. And so here you had the top doctor in the United States telling the Pentagon your regulations don't make sense from a medical point of view and their medical regulations. Um, Jake Carney, at the time President Obama's uh, spokesperson, was asked, so does the president agree with this study? Does he support discrimination? And, uh, and Jake Carney didn't have an answer and said, go ask the Pentagon. At that point, um, a group, Sparta, um, did a great job and uh, uh, got uh, one of the, Sparta's a group of about 200 transgender service members. Um, Sparta got one of their members uh, a full story in the Washington Post. Um, he's a great sailor and he very expensive to train him and he was fired for being transgender. Um, and the Post story got a lot of attention and I think was directly responsible uh, for um, prompting Secretary Hagel saying that he would be open to reviewing the policy, which doesn't sound like much, but that's a huge, that's the first crack in Humpty Dumpty to have the Secretary of Defense say, well, yeah, I'm open to, uh, to, um, to having the policy reviewed. Um, the New York Times followed that statement with a long editorial saying, you know, I think you need to kind of move it with this review because your policies don't make any sense. There's just been a report by the Surgeon General saying that there's no reason for firing transgender troops, so move along. And the next day, uh, sure enough, uh, the President's spokesperson uh, in the White House said not only is the Secretary of Defense in favor of um, uh, open to, to a review, but the President is open to a review as well. So that doesn't mean the policy is gonna change tomorrow, but, but once the White House says that it's open to reviewing the policy, um, that's, that's, the policy is going out the door. Until the person in the White House changes. Well, Senate it might take a long time. Um, president Obama might not be the president to do it, and you might get a Republican president. So, so it, this certainly might be a very drawn out process. And, and actually, you could also get uh, a statutory backlash in Congress, um, depending on who's in control of what, which will set the clock back potentially decades. Um, but that having been said, for now, uh, with a favorable administration and a regulation that the administration is open to reviewing, 
that's a that's a big big change. Thanks, Aaron. So let me um, ask you these questions. We'll see how we can do. So where where to go? Where should one go to get legal guidance um, on changing of military records or upgrading a discharge, especially for veterans who served during World War II? Right at, actually, this is right after World War II, 1946 to 1949 on this. So. www.outserve-sldn.org and click on legal assistance. Um, in all honesty, yes, that's so. So one of the arms that our organization, after the merger that we have kept, is providing legal assistance to uh, veterans that want to get their discharges upgraded um, and, and other kind of issues that they're dealing with. Uh, we have uh, hired a team of lawyers that uh, look at this, that, that push for the discharge upgrades. There's a specific discharge upgrade form on our website uh, that you know you put in all the information and, and they open your case and then they go ahead and, and, and start the proceedings. If there are other non-discharge upgrade type questions or, or legal help that, that is needed, there's a kind of a more generic form that you can go to and fill out and, and, and our legal team will get back to you with you know hopefully whatever questions uh, that you have. You know, no necessarily guarantees that we can change the world or you know answer every single question, but we can at least get the get the ball rolling and hopefully either you know help you out with the help you need or maybe refer you to, to somebody that's better equipped to do it. And there are discharge upgrades, but there's also you may not be aware that if you get kicked out for being gay your DD-214, which is your record of service, will actually show the reason for discharge, and it'll say right on there, homosexuality. And so a lot of people who are kicked out for being gay now have this, you know, anytime they apply for a job, sometimes they ask for this evidence of service, and you're essentially outing yourself every time you apply for a job. So it's not only the upgrade of the characterization of discharge, like from dishonorable to honorable or whatever, but also you can get a new DD-214 that does not have homosexuality written out in big letters on your paperwork as to your reason for discharge. And I believe so far this calendar year we've done almost 100 of those. So. so discharge upgrade is something that every organization that serves veterans works on because it's critical to accessing benefits. Without the right kind of discharge, um, we've decided as a nation in what strikes me as a somewhat unwise policy, to be honest, because some of the veterans who leave the military with uh, not only punitive, but non-honorable, non not the blue chip discharge, they need services the most. Uh, so changing that policy is another um, legislative effort that would make a difference for getting services to the people who need them most. Another question here, um, to what degree do you think a generational change in LGBT acceptance and awareness contributed to the change in the military's policy on LGB and now T service members? Huge, I mean. Just anecdotally, like huge. I mean, I think even the survey um, that they did, the Pentagon did of troops, you know, they showed the level of acceptance and resistance, you know, by age band, and um, pretty clear. It was a direct correlation, sort of like the older they were, uh, the more resistant, and the younger, the more like, you know, whatever. I'd say one one thing about that. Uh, one of the things I thought that was interesting about the timing of Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal, it took so long that the rest of society maybe with the exception of the Boy Scouts at the time and the Catholic Church had already moved. And uh, you had poll after poll after poll coming out showing between 70 and 80% of the public in, in favor of gays serving openly. Um, with the question of transgender military service, especially if the change happens sooner rather than later, there's a chance that the military could precede a lot of the attitudinal shifts that are just now happening and that are gonna happen more and more um, uh, over the next um, number of years. And so there's a way in which um, it could really have pretty profound implications for gender in America for, um, for the military to stop discriminating. Now, there, there's a downside to that too, um, which we could talk about, but, um, but, but yeah. Another really quick observation on that is, as well as, as it becomes more accepted, I see that the service members care less about it as an issue, and there's not, they don't feel it's normal to them. You know, 18 year old soldiers that signed up six months ago never knew what Commander Dunning had to deal with, you know, never knew what, what Aaron fought for. Um, and so they're just like, oh, this is the way it's always been. That's really cool, great. And they don't appreciate, you know, how, how we got here and that there's still work to do. So it's an interesting kind of counterpoint to, to the societal change. Yes, it makes it more normal, but. Is the pink class women still there? I haven't really seen that um, amongst active duty right now. Um, 
I, I'm sure it, it exists to a certain extent, but it, it's going away, I would think. I'll yeah. tell you once my lieutenant colonel board happens. Major, Major Mueller is a little more optimistic on that than I'd say I'd be. Um, I, uh, I don't know. That we don't have numbers for, um, for promotion boards for, uh, along sexual orientation lines. I don't think we ever will, actually. Um, but there's no doubt that the senior leadership is not all in the same place as mm -hmm. the next generation of service members. And, and military service is a rapid turnover environment. Um, not, not everybody makes it a career, but those who do make it a career uh, don't tend to have the most progressive attitudes. Um, and actually, the military, in some instances, has made people less progressive as we study them, for instance, at the Air Force Academy when they arrive versus the time that they leave. Their attitudes towards gender equality, for instance, have sometimes worsened rather than improved. Now, that, it may be that that's a bad rap now on the armed forces because of the emphasis on training towards dignity and respect and, and equality that is happening. I, I think the military is doing some of the most um, comprehensive and forward-thinking training on anti-sexual harassment and anti-sexual assault of any organizations right now. Um, but there's a lot that weighs against that in military culture and history and leadership still, and that's, I think that's going to be a tough, uh, tough road to get to equality on. It's certainly true, I don't know, the pink, maybe lavender ceiling? We were, uh, yeah. Certainly for women, um, the number of women, if we just look at women who have been you know, not quite fully integrated, still not quite fully integrated into the armed forces because of some limits on, um, on assignment still, but uh, there certainly aren't women who are represented at the highest ranks of the military compared to their representation overall. The women are about 15% of the armed forces today, uh, but a much higher percentage of some branches and lower of others. 5% of the Marine Corps, 20% of the U.S. Army Reserve, for instance. So there's, they're, they they're appear differently in different demographic groups, and um, there certainly hasn't been equivalent promotion opportunities for women throughout. Uh, this is a question that honestly stumps me, so I'm hoping our expert panelists can help on this one here. This is our last question from the audience. Um, what can be done to get the VA to accept MFTIs, marriage family therapist interns, into their treatment programs? This law was changed a few years ago to allow um, MFTIs in. So I guess they're not actually, although they are supposed to be accepting them, they're not accepting them. So what do you do when the VA is not actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. You've all been advocates of social change. How would you change this? How would you address this problem? <laughs> it's a, it, I mean, it depends on who's pushing for the change, but um, uh, in theory, you'd need, you'd need groups who would study what's wrong with the exclusionary policy and what benefits would follow from a more expansive um, relationship to what it means to be a mental health provider and then would do kind of lobbying and public education and maybe litigation and um, kind of an insider-outsider approach, but um, that's without knowing anything about the specific policy, so. And, and I would say, tell the stories of how this impacts everyday people. Um, I think that helped quite a bit in, in, in the fight that, that, that we've been fighting and, and when you can see how this impacts people, especially veterans, especially people that have written that blank check, look, this is causing harm to these individuals. This needs to be fixed. That is definitely a, an impetus to, to trying to fix something. So maybe I'll ask one more question here. Do, do any of you have pressing issues we haven't resolved that you'd like to raise before I do that? Yes. Okay, Aaron's up for a question here. Well, oh, so this, but you wanted to ask a last question as well? I, well, no, I'm, I'm, oh, I see oh, the floor here, go I, ahead. I, I think we do need to talk about the militarization of the gay and the queer community. And, um, and that's been kind of a, a, the elephant in the room a little bit. Um, um, but, but Zoe mentioned at the outset about the ways in which, as a society, we owe the veterans so much. And I say to that, okay, and but, we owe the teacher, we owe the person fighting fires, the police officer, the union member, the toll bridge collector, we owe them a lot too. And I feel like there's a way in which our, our, our kind of, I will use the word uncritical veneration of veterans and warriors does a lot of work to kind of push off the table some pretty important points about militarism and militarism of the queer community. And I feel like, yes, don't ask, don't tell repeal was a very important moment and I fought personally very hard for it, 
but, but what impact did that have on kind of pushing aside other voices in the gay community? And as we move forward um, with transgender inclusion, what, what effect will that have, for example, on genderqueer people who will not be accepted in the military right away, um, or gender neutral people? Um, and this is just not something that we've talked about yet. Do you have any alibis? I can't think of anything, to be honest. Any last questions from you all or issues you want to raise? I'll, I'll, I'll say in response to what Aaron said, I, this is, this is a, an important issue to reckon with in terms of social change and the energy of, of different movements. When we think about transgender rights, I have to say, until Aaron arrived on this issue and others started to really focus on this, post Don't Ask, Don't Tell, Transgender military service was not at the top of the list for those of us care, interested in transgender rights, more like em security and employment, health benefits, um, protection from violence. Those may all be changed by affecting the policy in the military, and uh, the panel today has suggested that's likely to happen if there's service for transgender uh, if there's an open service for transgender people in the military, that that would affect those other areas too in, in a potentially big way as full citizenship would be recognized. But it hasn't been the issue that has been at the top of the, uh, of, the uh, of people in, in that movement. Um, I'll just close by asking you to comment on, the military's in a drawdown now. We're in a withdraw from the, the, the wars that the U.S. has been engaged in in recent years, and in a time of likely scarcity moving forward. Now, Zoe mentioned that in the past, after 9-11, uh, the discharge rate under Don't Ask, Don't Tell dropped um, because of military necessity and exigency and readiness needs, and that's been consistent in the past as well. Generally, uh, minority groups have made inroads in equality and opportunity in the armed forces and elsewhere in society at times when the demand for services was so high that there, uh, there wasn't the will to continue to discriminate. So are we at risk in the, this time ahead of the military starting to discriminate more along the lines of sexual orientation or moving away from where it seems to be heading, a precipice that would lead inevitably towards transgender rights as we, as we move into a more scarce environment in the armed forces? Maybe I'm an eternal optimist, but it, it would seem to me that the, the, the train is going so fast right now that even with even with a drawdown, and, and and kind of the culture within the armed forces right now, we're kind of turning internally a little bit to kind of look at you know the sexual assault thing and how we treat people with dignity and respect. Um, that it, we almost could increase the work that we're doing because now we really are trying to take a look at okay, if we're going to have a leaner, better force, it really needs to be a leaner, better, more educated force. And so it would be a great opportunity. Again, my optimistic side. Um, but, but I think it, I think we can do that where we're going to focus more on education. We're going to focus more on making sure that everybody has equal rights and understands what's going on because we're all going to be, there's going to be less of us and we're going to have to work as a, as a better team to get to where we need to go. And the only way we can do that is if we have equality. And I'm optimistic as well. Uh, that's just my Midwest nature, I think. But um, I also see that, you know, like they're starting to recruit well, the military recruiter has been banned from San Francisco Pride. That's a whole other topic. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the military is reaching out and recruiting from the LGBT community and, you know, having Pride programs at the Pentagon and things like that. So um, it feels like, at least for now, even in a drawdown, they're still keeping a, you know, kind of broad embrace um, of, of diversity. Um, it, there's always room for improvement, obviously, but uh, I haven't seen that suddenly these programs are being kind of ignored because we don't need to recruit as aggressively. Okay, I wanna thank everybody um, for coming tonight. I wanna thank Alicia and Karen and Luis for setting this up, uh, the Cal, Cal Humanities, UC Humanities Research Institute, the Cal State Library, the San Francisco Public Library, um, and, and everybody here who came, and let's have a round of applause for our panelists. This program was one of five public conversations exploring different facets of the veteran experience conducted during the summer of 2014 as part of War Comes Home, a Cal Humanities statewide initiative to open minds to the critical issues veterans face when coming home from war. How should communities welcome service members back? 
How can we build bridges of understanding between those who have served and those who have not? For more information, visit www.calhume.org. Public Conversations is a project of Cal Humanities in partnership with the University of California Humanities Research Institute, the California State Library, and California Public Libraries. It is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Bay Tree Fund, the Whitman Institute, and the U.S. Institute of Museum and Library Services under the provisions of the Library Services and Technology Act administered in California by the State Librarian. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording do not necessarily represent those of Cal Humanities, the University of California Humanities Research Institute, the California State Library, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Baytree Fund, or the Whitman Institute.